Hi, welcome back to Wellness Wave Radio. My name is Phil George. I'm a clinical biochemist, a certified personal trainer, and a health coach. And I'm here with my good friend Paul, who is also a certified personal trainer. And Paul, what exactly do you do? Well, um, uh, on top of being the certified personal trainer, I'm a high school strength and conditioning specialist and a youth speed and agility specialist. And we talked before, we both have roots to Leicester, right? That's right. As I mentioned to you, I coached for many years. I coached the Becker uh, College men's tennis team. I also taught some uh, anatomy and physiology courses at Becker. So I spent a lot of time across the street. So this is, uh, this is kind of home to me. And you had mentioned that you also have some roots to Leicester. Tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely. I'm from town. And um, maybe the most interesting answer is right in this very building upstairs with the basketball quarters, there's a little stage. That's where I got my start performing live. I was 13 years old in the seventh grade and I was in a rock band and played in front of all my friends. And as nervous as I was, I was petrified. It was the start of me building my confidence, which as we know is so important, not just for adults, for, for kids. So it's interesting in this very same building. Yeah, so it, for the, roots, the roots here. So I, every time I drive up, I just remember all my time, you know, coaching, coaching at Becker, coaching, coaching the men's tennis team. And that's one of the reasons we kind of connected because we both go way back with sports and that's the whole thing and how important sports are, are, are for kids. And that's when it, and we also have a good friend, you know, and I'm sure he's going to be, be watching, Coach Kane, one of the top uh, the tennis coaches in New England. He would say one of the top tennis coaches in the world, but we're gonna, we'll, we'll narrow that down a little bit, Jim, just, just New England for now until he, until he conquers the world. So we had many conversations. We were over at your gym, by the way, very impressive, huge Thank place. You. We'll get into exactly what you do and how you can help. And I noticed too, uh, coming onto the show, I noticed there's so many uh, sports uh, being recorded from the studio in Leicester. There's a, it, Leicester seems to be a really, really big sports town. So can you tell us a little bit about what makes you different from uh, the average coach and of, uh, how, how would you actually help coaches and help uh, athletes uh, improve? Well, I try to look at them, you know, look beyond the athlete, look beyond the sport or sports that they play, right? Because they're human beings first and foremost. And in, in my case, they're developing kids. So they need to be handled and treated a little differently. And, you know, we're both old, you know, we're old, but... Wait, wait, wait. Speak for yourself. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you know I, I'm immature. That's, I guess that's different. Okay, no, go ahead. all good. Totally understood, Phil. But we come from a different generation, right? And the things that flew back then don't fly now. The way we treat people is, is different and it needs to be, but a lot of coaches seem to be stuck in that old school mentality and mindset and kids don't seem to respond to it very well. So I, we talked and I think the big thing is, and we talked again with, uh, with, with Coach Kane, is sports is more than just getting better. It's also learning discipline. We talked about that and making progress and so much so many kids now are tied to their phone and everything else and I just want to get into a little bit into the higher levels of sports professional athletes they have more than one coach they have a, they have a coach that watches their form they have a coach in nutrition and then they have a, basically a strength and agility coach and that's kind of what you do and we talked before a lot of times with um, coaches a good example my son went to Burncourt High School and he had a teacher there, and she uh, also coached the women's uh, tennis team. And what I find out, I found that to be true, and I think you know, you'll agree with this, a lot of these coaches, they, they may play the sport, but they don't really, can't coach the sport. They don't know the intricacy of the sport. In fact, Coach Kane uh, talked about he was a big uh, football, uh, baseball player, but they needed a tennis coach. He didn't know anything about tennis, <laughs> but they, they roped him into it. He learned tennis. And, but with you, what you're doing is uh, you're actually, the, the, you're certified in this and this is what you do. So maybe they're playing tennis. I know you're, you're involved with volleyball now, although you told me you know nothing about volleyball, but we talked before is sports are all interrelated. Throwing a football is this, is this almost the same motion as throwing a baseball. It's almost the same motion as serving. Mm -hmm. So, and even though you've never, you've never actually played volleyball, you knew the whole thing of unwinding and hitting and all the rest of this stuff. So they, they brought you in, uh, the, and uh, I think it was like a, 
semi-pro volleyball? It's a club volleyball So a big, big time, though you don't even know it, you were able to look at the different, um, different actions of these players, the different uh, mechanisms, and say, okay, you're doing, change this a little bit, change that a little bit. And again, I think what you're doing, again, with the, you know, in terms of soccer or anything else, you're showing them the correct footwork. Does that, that sound about right? It does, it does. Um, sports have more similarities than differences. While on the surface, they appear to be very different, right? But footwork, that's the foundation, that's the base. Most sports, other than, say, crew, when you're in a boat, we spend on our feet, right? So the footwork, the base beneath us, is if it's not, if it's not the same, it's very similar. And as you alluded to, say, for the upper body, you know, Volleyball now, the serve. Yeah. Some will do a tennis, throwing a football, a baseball, a softball, a javelin. And it's very similar to me, but it's maybe about solving problems. When I first met the director for this club, it was at Oxford High School. She coached the girls there, and I just saw something that threw a red flag off in my mind, the way that the girls were landing when they jumped. The knees would go inward, which they call in valgus which is a precursor for knee injuries, ACL tears. So I was able to correct that problem for her instantly. And I think I won her respect and her trust and she knew that I could solve problems. So it was like you said, you make a little adjustment here, a little adjustment there using the coach's eye, as we call it. Some people just don't have that eye. And they haven't been trained like you are. And that's the other thing. Other thing we talked about is, well, why would, um why would somebody go in and, you know, and have their kid and have their kid trained by you? And what I thought about right away is, first of all, confidence, because, uh, you know, kids are always trying to fill it, uh, fit in with the crowd. But, you know, if you have that confidence, you're really good at something. Because I remember when I, uh, when I started playing, when I started playing tennis, um, and I really, you know, like, like you, I, you know, I go out and I'll hit a thousand balls and things like that. And I was up at the, at the remember, up at the Paxton Tennis Club, and I was the poorest guy up there. <laughs> Everybody was rich except for me. But was one thing I had that they didn't have. I was one of the top tennis players up there. And that actually kind of like with golf, it's, it's kind of a business game too. So with tennis, I get to meet a lot of really, really, you know, people that were very successful. And then they kind of tutored me in the business part of it. Mm. And but I was a good tennis player, so they wanted me to play tennis. And I see that almost like the, uh, like the Williams sisters of uh, Venus and Serena that came out of, you know, out, out of, you know, out of a kind of, a, you know, poverty. And now, you know, they're taking off. So it's a way to, to kind of also get you into, into, you know, into, into something else by being, by being very good at sports. But I think what I'm trying to go with this is if your kid is talented and you want to maybe they get a full boat to UNH for soccer, that's $30,000 a year. That's $120,000 potentially. Mm -hmm. And I, I know you said we can't, we can't guarantee this, right? True. But even if you get to that point, uh, one of my friends, her daughter got a full boat to UNH, you know, on a soccer scholarship. Mm -hmm. And the other thing uh, with, uh, to this day, this girl is playing in, in boys' leagues now because she's so good. And again, f for your confidence, and not to mention your health, because the health benefits of sports is huge, but take, you're going to take this kid to the next level. Uh, did I have that about right? Well, that would be the hope of the plan, <laughs> the dream, right? As, as, as you said earlier, we can't guarantee that, right? But as cliche as it sounds, if you put the time in doing the proper training outside of the sport or sports that you play, it is a game changer. As cliche as that sounds, right? But it's true. Strength and speed and power are the attributes that athletes really need to work on. The sports skills are super important. If you can't play the game that you're in, you're gonna get left behind. But if assuming all skill levels are equal, the strongest and the fastest athlete or athletes will rise to the top and win. It's, it's a no-brainer to me, but maybe some people just don't get that yet. And, and what's that famous quote you give me all the time, Paul? Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's an old one. Um, that dates back to 1855. Frederick Douglass is the gentleman's name. He was a freed slave and a statesman. And the quote he has, which I kind of live by, it's almost like my mantra, is it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken adults. And we know that's to be true, right? But nowadays, fast forward, it's 170 years ago that that gentleman made that quote. So he was way ahead of his time. 
now we're seeing broken children. You know, the, the health be physical, mental, emotional, and even spiritual health is in a bad state. And, and I see and hear a lot because I deal with hundreds and hundreds of kids every year. And it's, you know, part of it's sad. But instead of focusing more on the problems, I focus on the solution. You know, how can I help that individual? You know, it's not just the strength and the speed, as, as you alluded to it. It's the confidence. You know, that's I, the foundation. And I think that that's the other thing because, uh, again, with the footwork, and I know I played, a, I played a lot of basketball, and obviously I played a lot of tennis, and the footwork with basketball and tennis are so similar. It's the short steps and this, this, and this. And I, when, I, when I watched some of your workout at the gym with the kids you're working on, you have them that cross over this way, cross over that way, do this, this, and this. That translates probably even, I'm guessing it's going to, I don't know anything about volleyball, I'm guessing it'll translate to volleyball. Again, short, you know, you're, in a, you're in a very confined space and the footwork is going to be identical. So uh, you correct me if I'm wrong, you're taking them out there. You probably say, well, I want you to, I, I've seen a little bit of what you do, go out there and do this footwork and you're watching them. Oh, you're doing this wrong. Adjust it, adjust it, adjust it. So even if you're not teaching them anything at all with volleyball or whatever, when they get back to their coach uh, in high school, they have the footwork down. They have the footwork down, which is so, which is so, so important. And again, not to keep hopping back to Coach Kane, but Coach Kane says that you, the footwork has to be has to be right. You're going to be hopping over there. That was the whole thing. You hop over here, hop over there, but in a very specific way. You want to be in the right place at the right time. Right, and uh, maybe the first person there, first to the ball, first person to the ball is a, a saying I use a lot. You know, if you can be quick, because most, you know, volleyball is a perfect example. You know, there's six people on each side, and they may be in a five yard box. Not that they don't leave that box from time to time, but, and they're not confined to it, but if they're just quick in that short area, football, it's a 10 yard fight, as they say, right? So it's quickness. You know, speed is speed. Speed is, you know, measured as top speed, right? But it's acceleration and quickness. The agility, which is changes of direction. Because unless you're running track or, say, cross country, it's not all in a straight line. You know, this change of direction. So can people decelerate, which means slow down? Can they stop? Can they stop on a dime? You know when you drive your car, if you slam on the brakes, they don't just stop instantly. But I try to teach athletes how to move. I pride myself in, in teaching them movement patterns that when we were kids, not to say we're old, but in our generation, we had more free play where parents didn't tell us what to do all the time. We were out of the house always just playing, exploring and discovering. We learned how to move and we never really seemed to get hurt. Nowadays, a lot of kids get hurt because they become physically illiterate and their movement quality is poor. So they actually need the supplemental training that I offer because they're not getting into the sports, which are mostly focused on sports-specific skills. Right. When I found, when I used to teach tennis, is, uh, is, was one of the things that I used to, had a few sayings I would say to people, is in tennis, tennis is, is an unnatural act because if it feels good, you're probably doing it wrong. It goes against mm. almost everything, almost everything you feel you should do. In fact, when I would, uh, when I would, uh, there's another thing called a muscle memory pattern. Get a little bit into the uh, neurobiology here. What happens is uh, your nerves. It, it, there's an expression in neurology: the neurons that fire together, wire together. So the more you do something, it creates like, uh, it's like going through a forest, right? You got, you got the trees, you get the grass, you get the path, and all of a sudden you keep going the same path all the time. That's easy. So the neurons want to pass the path of least resistance. So they go down there. You do the same thing over and over again. You default to that pattern. So when I used to teach tennis, and I'm sure you find this what you do also, is uh, it's so hard to, to un, un, to un uh, teach bad habits. Mm. They're so used. You're so used to doing it. You do it over and over and over again. I would much rather have a people, a person start from scratch. Goes back to your saying about getting, getting, get them young, teach them correctly from the beginning, than to tend to unlearn the bad habits. It's so hard. In fact, when I taught, when I taught tennis, people had played for a while, and the worst ones were the great athletes, Paul, because they were used to doing this, this, and they try to muscle the ball, right? They try to muscle it, and with, with, with golf or tennis, 
you've got to be free flowing. You've got to be really, really take it easy. But guys, right, we want to use the testosterone. We want to muscle that ball. So th that's what I found is trying to, un to unteach it. So it's so much better if they go to you in the very beginning, okay, and teach them the right way as opposed to getting all the, all the, all the, all the bad stuff. So I think that's one of the reasons why, again, you want to, you want to learn in the beginning and, and how to learn it from the, from the very start. No, I agree 110%. There's a question I get a lot as it pertains to, especially lifting weights. You know, sometimes lifting weights gets a bad rap. People think it's going to stunt your growth, for example, which is not possible. But the reality is, especially going back to the old school, a lot of people were taught the wrong way. And males tend to be worse, no offense, we are men, right? But especially with the loads that they choose. They call it ego lifting. Exactly. So they tend to hurt themselves. So if you can teach, whether it's a boy or a girl, young enough, kids at a certain age, pre-middle school, their central nervous systems are just ready to literally imprint like old school film. And, and those memory, you know, yeah. and those movement patterns, there's simple patterns that people shouldn't need to be taught, but they do in this day and age because we spend a lot of time seated. People are on computers, they're on their phones, they're in poor posture. And it's just, it's been a train wreck for the body. And it, it manifests itself in a huge way in sports because that's all you're doing is watching people move. And then they become dangerous to themselves where a lot of kids get hurt. So, if you get them in young, they're like a dry sponge where you literally just throw them in a bucket of water and they absorb it. Sometimes you just try to say less and don't overcoach or overcue because kids will figure it out. If you get that, you know, if, if you make it more cerebral, then they get in their head where you want them to get out of the head and just, you know, focus on the body. But in my, you know, in my experiences, a lot of coaches don't coach. A lot of teachers don't teach, and a lot of parents don't parent. Those words are both a noun and a verb, right? A coach as a noun with a capital C, and coach with a small c as a verb. And it's sad where these kids aren't getting what they need, sometimes in sports, in school, or at home. So again, supplemental stuff sometimes fills in the blanks. Yeah, and I just want to get back. To, to, it's important to get started right, as a, to, to learn something uh, correctly from the beginning, as opposed to trying to unlearn it later on. I go to the gym just about just about every day, and it's sad to see. And uh, you know, people come in, and they pay their twenty dollars, whatever, to, to join the gym, and then they're they're walking around, and you see them, and like you, I'm a certified trainer. The, everything they do is wrong. I don't know about you, if I'm going to spend that amount of time, I'm going to either hire a trainer or I'm going to have somebody show me what to do correct as opposed, and the worst thing is, again, you get injured. And I try to, like one of the gyms I belong to is Planet Fitness and they have the big sign, no judgment zone. So I try to, you know, but it was, uh, there, was one, there was one time, uh, I'll show you, actually, I'll show you, this is called a preacher curl. So uh, people don't know what you sit in a chair like this, and what you do is you you pull up a bar, and it's called it's a bicep curl. Mm -hmm. And so I was watching. He was an older guy, and I'm watching him, and he goes behind this, and he goes like it's off the thing, and he, he lifts it like this with his legs. <laughs> so, each rep. Each rep. Oh my I'm goodness! Like, I'm like, I, I couldn't help myself, Paul. I had to say something. I said, you know what? I said. You know, I want to let you know you, you're really doing that wrong. You're not working your biceps. You're working you, you're working your quadriceps. But people get obsessed with lifting heavy stuff, and they just want to lift heavy things. But they don't. They're not isolating the muscles. So uh, that's why it, this goes to training. But I remember you telling me the story on the uh, doing pull-ups, and the girl the girl going in there, and they they can't do any any pull-ups. So because they're just too weak. And then what you do, they have this little rubber bandy thing, mm -hmm. the kind of assisted pull-up. It's called an assisted pull-up. And you maybe start with a 10-pound, you know, uh, help. Then you cut back to the 8-pound. Then, the, then all of a sudden, the girl says, oh, my God, I can do it on my own. Again, it's more than just the physical thing. It's, 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 it's I can do it. If I can do this, then maybe I can finish my homework. I've, you learn, you learn, they, the discipline is a muscle, you know, and the more you develop it, the stronger it gets. So it starts 
not to mention the health benefits with sports, but it starts the whole thing with, and plus you've got a nice group of kids, they make new friends. Oh yeah. They're not hanging out with druggy kids and stuff like that. They're not doing this. They have, one of the things they did with kids, kids and gang members is take them out of the gang and they give them a new family, a good family, not, not you know, kids, you know, healthy kids and stuff like that. So I'm guessing there must be a lot of camaraderie at your gym too. Oh, absolutely. It, I'm proud of what it's developed into over the seven years that I've been open. It's a, a true culture of together, and it's a family of families where many of the kids have siblings in the program, or as you just said, they make new friends, and, and that doesn't come easily anymore. Kids are in a different space, very awkward. Very, They're online all the time, and they never have... This, again, they can't communicate. They like can't this. communicate. So by it's forcing. It, in fact, a lot of the kids at you know MIT and WPI, they're on the spectrum and they have classes on how to talk to people, because everything right. is online now. So in a way, there's an additional benefit. I think to call it a twofer, not only with that sports, but it's also that socialization because they're with the other kids. So it's a way. It's a way to socialize. And these other kids that are into exercise and nutrition. They're going to have, uh, there's an expression, you are, you are the same thing as the other three or four people you associate with. So if you associate with good people, you're going to develop good habits. Absolutely. Rising tides raise all ships, right? So if you're in the right body of water with the right people, you lift each other up, you know, as, as it should be. But it isn't always, which is sad, you know. But you can you bring in kids from all different all different sports, uh, working with them with the, with the uh, with the agility, and the other thing we were talking about doing somewhere down the road again, could Coach Kane is maybe going and starting like a little a little tennis clinic there too. I'll, I'll keep the listeners you know informed on that. That that will happen probably somewhere yeah. down the road. People uh, now it's winter. If you want to maybe get started uh, started you know with tennis again, and again you're not you're not a tennis guy, right? No, but um, years ago I was, uh, I used to run the weight room at St. Peter Marion High School before they closed and merged with Holy Name to become St. Paul. And I did train the number one, number two, and number three singles girls. And that year they went like 90% wins. They barely lost. You know, they became so strong, so powerful, so quick and agile and fast and explosive. And all that, blah, 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 right? That's all great. But underneath, they became more confident, you know, because another saying that I go by a lot is people will forget what you say and people will forget what you do, but they always remember how you made them feel. So as we talked about how kids are in a different space nowadays, if you can just make them feel good as a human being, you know, let them know that they're seen and heard and that someone cares about them and is willing to help, that's all it takes. You know, if you can communicate with them, get them to communicate. And if, if it's, uh, you know, possible to connect with them as a person, then the hard work falls into place. All that stuff comes easily. Right. The other thing we talked about, uh, actually, before we came on air uh, with Art also, I'd like to g g maybe have you give some of your success stories. So we start off the one with the bat speed. Uh, that's the one I liked. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've got a young man. He's a junior at Wachusett High School baseball player. He used to play other sports in the day, but now he's focusing on baseball. He wants to go play in college, and I'm sure he has dreams of playing the major leagues. So he came to me. The main goal is speed. In baseball, they're test on the 60-yard dash. In, in their world, it's 30 yards from home to first, so 60 from home to second. They picked that distance. And our main focus was to get faster. But in the midst of designing any program, I still include a lot of core work, mobility work, which is like flexibility, and strength work. So not only has he got amazingly fast, his the exit velocity, and they have all kinds of high-tech pieces of equipment that measure this, his exit velocity when he hits a baseball is like 100 plus miles an hour now. So he, at age 16, not even 17, is close to a college and major league baseball players are producing as far as their power output. So we got maybe eight or nine weeks into the season, and I can't wait to go see him because not only will he be crushing the ball, he'll be running for extra bases too because on top of it, he's massively faster. 
So the combination of seeing and feeling himself get stronger, faster, and more explosively powerful just raises the bar of his confidence, his level of belief. I remember reading way back when with Stealing Bases, it's the same thing. It's the first step, right? It's huge. And it, it's a crossover and all that stuff like that. And that could be the difference between being, being, you're winning and, and, and losing, obviously, in a game. But it's the same thing. By, at, at that level, a quarter of a second or another mile per hour, it's a huge, huge difference. But I, the other thing, you, you had, how about the other, there's other success stories you had also with uh, some of the girls? Would you tell us a little bit about that? Probably too many to even remember, right? <laughs> but um, I always use these two examples, almost like polar opposites, where I had a young man and a young woman, both in high school, both drastically different athletes, if you look at them, you meet them. I won't say totally different, but the young lady was a cross-country runner. And she, as a sophomore in high school, is a state champion in the Division One, which is the highest division. I think there was 120 girls in the, in the last race that she was in. She beat every single one of them. She ran 3.1 miles in 18.03. So that's 3.601 miles, back to back to back, like nothing. So that's her. And I'm not going to name any of these people for confidentiality. And the young man, I worked all through high school, for, primarily for football speed, but he also ran track. Senior year, he was the state champ in the 55. So 55 meters is maybe 60 yards, right? So 60 yards, three miles. They were both the best of the best that year. Beat everyone, hands down. So, so it, it works. And again, just um, to recap, so the reason, in my opinion, if, if, I, if I had a young son or a young daughter and I wanted it, and you know, I'm obviously big into sports, you know, you know, this is, you know, my life is still this to a certain extent. This is the next level. In other words, again, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of a lot of coaches in high school, uh, they bring them on board because they're, they're a teacher and they know the sport, but they may not, nothing bad, you know, God bless them, but they don't, they don't have your expertise. So you're going to make them, uh, you're going to make them, you know, a, a better on, on, on all sports in terms of what's going on with that building self-confidence and also also building up uh you know a, a good a good a fr you know a good friendship group among them yeah, absolutely so paul uh if somebody uh wanted to contact you how would they do that um they could reach out via my cell phone number i've had the same cell phone number for 20 years it's a business phone <laughs> so i don't mind giving it over there and my email address my cell phone is 508-847-6761 the email address is trainwithpaul at AOL.com. And my facility is called Speed World. It's at 243 Stafford Street, right in Worcester. And I'm even willing to offer a special incentive for any listeners that reach out if they'd like to come down. Um, I could offer them a free class if it's girls, because they have girls' classes. And if it's a boy, I'll give them a half price off on an introductory session so that they can come try it out. Yeah, and for our listeners, uh, you can do a meet and greet. But go down. To, his gym is so impressive. I was, I couldn't believe it's a huge gym. He has all the all the equipment in there. Uh, it's just, it's just a great way to get the, you know, get the kids and get them, get them, get them, get them to the next level. And uh, so, thanks so much for coming, in, Paul. And uh, we'll be, we'll be back next week. And uh, thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. One of the most common questions I'm asked as a biochemist and health coach is what are the best supplements to take? Choosing supplements is a tricky business. Many companies have poor quality control and questionable ingredients. In the past, I had to send clients to several different websites. I am now able to offer one-stop shopping for all the quality brands I recommend with no shipping cost and a lower price in most cases. Just email me, philgeorge at charter.net for a free consult.